as we've been engaging in the A Blameless Life series, we've been reciting the five precepts each gathering in Pali and in English. So we'll do that again and play along or not as works for you. No requirements. Panati Pata. Vairani Sikapadam Samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from taking the life of any living being. Adina Dana, where am I? Sikapada, Samadhyami, I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not offered. Kame su, Kame su, Mucha chara, Mucha chara, Where am I? Where am I? Sikha Pada, Sikha Pada, Samadhi Ami, Samadhi Ami. I undertake the training, I undertake the training, to refrain, to refrain, from misuse or inappropriate use of my sexual energy. Musa Wada Musa Wada Veramani Veramani Sikha Pada Sikha Pada Samadhi Ami Samadhi Ami I undertake the training I undertake the training to refrain from false or harmful speech Sura, Sura, Maria, Maria, Vajapamanatana, Where am I? Sikha Pada, Samadhyami, Samadhyami. I undertake the training. I to refrain from consuming substances which cloud the mind. Thank you for, for playing along or not playing along as supports you. Appreciate it. This evening the intention was to focus on the second precept or second mindfulness training. I wanted to read that directly off of a five mindfulness training card. What do you think is in my bag? Doesn't matter, I have it here. Okay. No, doesn't have to be perfect. I thought it would be fun to actually show you one of the cards at Plum Village and at the other Plum Village practice centers. If you receive transmission from, you know, it used to be from TikTok Hutton, but you know, from any of the monastics, if you receive transmission of the five mindfulness trainings and you make a commitment to practice with them, you get a cute little card. So I'll show you at the end and in the card, it's like a threefold, it's written all of the trainings. So the second mindfulness training, as all of the precepts do that we offered in Pali and in the translation or the modified Augusta Hopkins version, the translation from Amravati and Bayagiri, we refrain from some behavior. And then if you go into the Plum Village world, it's always aware of a suffering caused by. So in my mind, like, I'm practicing to refrain from this behavior because I'm aware of the suffering that it causes. 
right? And it's a commitment renewed again and again. I'm practicing this. It's not like, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this. It's not a one and done, it's over kind of thing. And it's not a, oh, let me go beat up myself or shit all over myself because I did this thing. It's like, yeah, you're human, you fuck up. Like, it's inevitable. And we can practice, we can undertake our training for our heart minds because we have seen the pain of, of the unskillful behavior, of, um, of the unwholesome behavior. It's, it's pretty simple. Not mandates. So kind of like we did in the beginning, I'd like to invite you to tune into your heart, to tune into your mind, to tune into your body. I'm going to read this precept in the Plum Village style, so it's a mindfulness training all the way through. Certainly once, maybe more than that, and I invite you to notice what happens inside of you. How does your heart mind respond to these words? The second mindfulness training in the Plum, Bur in the Plum Village world is offered as true happiness, which is a very interesting kind of lip of not stealing. The five training precepts as modified by Ajahn Amaro, uh, a senior monk in the Ajahn Chah lineage, of Ayagiri Amarvati that I mentioned a moment ago. It's like these modified versions particularly offered for young adults or children that's e equally applicable to adults. The second training, I promise to try not to take anything which is not given to me. And in doing so, we cultivate dana, generosity. It's an antidote for selfishness. I mean, you're not going to find a person on the earth who hasn't at one moment in time been selfish. And we're not always generous. Adina, Dana, anything in Pali with that A sound in the front of it is a negation. So it's like, not going to take the life, not going to take what hasn't been offered. And I just wanted to lift up that it's also a cultivation of generosity. which maybe leads to true happiness. So the second mindfulness training, true happiness. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. I will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. Tune into the heart, tune into the mind, tune into the body. Noticing how the words are landing, how they're being received, where there's dissonance, where there's resonance. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion. And that running after wealth, fame, power, and central pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I am aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions, and that I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on earth and stop contributing to climate change. So sometimes I find, and others find, 
that the mindfulness trainings as offered by Thich Nhat Hanh and by Club Village can maybe be setting a bar that's kind of hard to, to reach or hard to meet. It's a lot of, lot of possible ways to practice this. And so I offer that the inclination of like possible ways. Like so there's just something in here that kind of like, oh yeah, there's resonance there. That's a way that this training can be explored. And the parts where there's distance, like, yeah, don't, don't pick that up. Yeah. I know that for me, the practice of right livelihood can get in a tangle of straining and striving and over-efforting, which doesn't really feel very good in the heart, mind, and body. And it's my intention. And it can get like super tight. Like, that's not what it's about. It's not about perfection. Not a one of us is perfect. So to take care and listening to this, to realize that, oh, it's a North Star. It's a Guyanese, it's an invitation, it's an inclination. It's a training. And the idea of practicing generosity, practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. Just the idea of that feels good in my heart. Like, yeah, I try, and then I fuck up, like I'm a human. But I'm practicing it. I'm practicing it. And that intention to practice, that intention to practice like that feels good in my heart. That desire to contribute in a wholesome way. I find that for this, this heart mind to think about not doing something kind of evokes that thing I'm trying to not do. And so little I can incline towards, oh, what am I wanting to put? Oh, the cultivating generosity. I can feel that in my body. What happens for you? I can feel lightness in my body and expansion. Maybe a little, a little bit of joy. It's like, oh yeah, that, I'm interested in being generous. And Luckily, at least in this moment, my mind doesn't go on to this like, list of ways that I haven't been generous recently. Like, that's not really forward leading. But sometimes the mind does that too, right? It wants to go to the negative. There's a negativity bias, and that's your fault, also conditioned. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not, ha are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. I feel like that can be taken to mean like, oh, I should make sure everyone else is okay. So that I'll be okay. But it can also be to it's like the opposite. I need to make sure that I'm okay. So that my interactions with others, they are also okay. Because if I'm not okay, I am not skillful. When I'm interacting with someone else, I'm impacting them my person. So, oh, there's this way that we're generous toward the world and towards others by tending to ourselves. And there are times, places, situations in which we can be generous to others and kind to others and caring to others in a way that then can help them to be generous or kind and caring to others. And a beautiful, positive feedback loop can, can be occurring. When I was thinking about the moments in my life or times in my life when I was the least skillful, when I'm the least skillful, and it's always because I'm suffering in some way, right? I'm depleted, or I don't quite have all that I need, or the conditions aren't sufficient, or whatever like the thing is. But it, it comes, that unskillful behavior comes out of some internal suffering. And so sometimes that can be a motivation to tend to ourselves and care for ourselves so that we can be more skillful. And I think about society, and I think about, I was thinking about this this afternoon, like, Who's stealing? People who are in need, right? People who are suffering. Ain't no one going out and stealing some physical thing who isn't suffering in some way. Or even the white collar criminals who are like stealing whatever nonsense they're stealing, it comes from a lack, it comes from a sense of suffering. And certainly the people who are stealing stuff from Walgreens, it's because they don't have enough, right? It's rooted in suffering. It's not, 
because there's something wrong with them as an individual. It's because their basic needs are being met, because there's a suffering inside. And I feel like one of the greatest ways that that suffering manifests for me these days is really rooted in, in whiteness and rooted in this capitalist culture is constantly saying, you're not enough. You need more. You need to do more, or be more, or have more, or get more. And it feeds this like, let me go get, let me get me some. Like, it feeds this compulsive grab, whether it's a land grab, or money grab, or an attention grab. It's like, it's a kind of stealing. It's a kind of stealing of our sanity, of our serenity, of our contentment. No, 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 look over here. Buy this new shiny thing, then you'll feel better. So I feel like that's probably like the greatest stealing that's going on today, is this stealing of our own ease that we could have if we lived in a society and a culture it was making sure that everyone's basic needs were being met. And maybe, you know, maybe everyone who's here listening to this, maybe you have your basic needs met or the possibility of having your basic needs met. And yet there are still moments where depletion is present, such that that impulse to kind of Feel something to grab something to get something so that you can feel better still arises. So if you notice that, I invite you to tune in to recognize oh, what need or is there a need inside of me that's not being met? that I can meet. For me, it's often coming back to something really basic of hungry, angry, lonely, tired. It's like, oh, I need to eat something. Or I'm thirsty. Or I'm hot. I've been hot the last couple of days. I'm not used to 77 degrees or 97 degrees. I guess it's been way warmer in San Francisco than it usually is. And my system has acclimated to this climate and it's hot and I'm uncomfortable. Right. Causes and conditions, like that's what happens. And from that discomfort, there's more irritability, there's less skillfulness, there's way, way more feelings of, of um, self-disparaging thoughts, like way less contentment in here because there's a physical discomfort. So it's like, okay, go get in the ocean. Take a cool shower. Have a glass of water, like do something to tend to this heat that is present. Put your hair up, put on a linen dress, like take care of yourself. Get something to eat. Lonely, pick up the phone or be present with myself. I find a lot of times with loneliness, I'm like looking for connection. And if I stop and connect with myself, I can meet that better than I can do a connection with another human being. Because other humans are also imperfect humans, and they're not satisfactory. And I'm sure I want them to, all of the time. They can't. And maybe there isn't something wrong with that. I don't need to make a problem out of that, but I can learn to show up for myself. I can learn, I am learning, I am practicing to connect with myself. And then sometimes I'm just tired, and I'm not sleeping well enough because of the heat, so yeah, I'm more tired. So then I cut myself some slack. Oh yeah, you're tired. You're not at your best. You're not your most skillful. It's okay. And if there isn't the layering on of the shitting on myself, then I don't feel worse. It's like, oh, I'm just tired. Okay. And that's freedom. Like, that's ease. That's available to us. We don't buy it. You know, we don't buy the grab or the internal it makes us want to do some grabbing of our own. Oh, 
Also, as I was preparing for the talk this evening, I was thinking back to times in my life when I have like formally broken this precept, when I have stolen. Another thing about the precepts as they're offered at um, Ajahn Chah Branch Monasteries is that it's about the intention. I love this in the monastic code. So the masters were all celibate in the various Theravada communities. And the monks, but everyone's fully cisgender in this space. It's a little bit of a challenge that they're navigating, but so I'm not going to try to have that conversation at the moment. But so just assume that also everyone's cisgender. The monks are not allowed to touch a woman or be touched by a woman. And if there's a brushing that happens unintentionally, no problem. And the same is true of dreams, right? If you have a dream that's sexual in nature, it's not a problem. It's not an intentional, volitional act. And that feels so important to me. That even in the precepts for the monastics, we're not supposed to be perfect. We're training, we're training. And in the stealing front, maybe you also have had an experience of stealing. Mine were, were rather inconsequential. And yet the experience of stealing and then like feeling the remorse of that was invaluable. I learned from that. So the first one was when I was pretty little, I don't know, seven, five, something like that. And we were at a, it was with my mom, I, and a couple other people, I think, were like this a deli diner in Philly. And I saw some money sitting on the table as so we were walking out. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna take that money. <laughs> I, I, could, I could have a little, I was have spending money, you know? And I don't know, I don't think more than a couple minutes passed. And there was like, recognized that I had taken the money and I was reprimanded for taking the money. And I had to put it back and like, like I didn't even know I was doing anything wrong. I'm just like, oh, there's some money there. I could use some money. And I took some money. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. That's someone else's money. That's a tip. You need to go put that money back. And so I went through that whole process and I was young and I wasn't reprimanded. I wasn't shamed. I was just shown, no, that's not cool. This is how we do it. And I love when the trains can be held in that way because we don't need to be slapped on the wrist. We don't need to be shamed and blamed. Like it's not forward leading. That's not wholesome. That's not beneficial. But touching into the remorse of an unskillful action, that can be quite forward leading. Like recognizing, oh yeah, that doesn't feel good. if we can do that without them layering on shame and blame. And then the other time was in high school. And I don't know if any of you have made, like done any embroidery or made friendship bracelets or made things out of string or thread out of knots, but we did that a lot when I was in junior high and high school in Philly. And we made these things out of embroidery floss. And my friend and I were at the, <laughs> I want to say what my grandmother said, which is five, five and dime. We were at the, we were at the Woolworths, we were at Woolworths, which I guess today is like kind of similar to like a small Target. Just kind of have everything, including rows of embroidery floss. And then stole the embroidery floss, and we're like, or at least I, I don't know what she was doing, but I was like having all kinds of feelings about it. And can I tell you, embroidery floss costs like 78 cents. It's like ridiculous. But maybe it was like a coming of age experience, you need to try it out. But I felt so uncomfortable about it that I gave myself away. And so the security guard found us, and like, 
got caught us at the door and like sent us back in and we had to go and talk to these people and it was so awful. It was so horrible. It was the smallest thing. Like the action that I was engaged in was like such a benign actual lawyer boss. But the underlying like I'm gonna take something. Oh, so not good feeling. Showing our good feeling. And you know, I feel fortunate that I have had my basic needs met. Or I haven't needed to steal something in order to meet my basic needs. But I get it. I get that. I understand that. I do not blame anyone for doing that. Like, yeah, shit is fucked up. And we could undertake training to find greater freedom for ourselves. Just make it a selfless, selfish act. We want our own freedom. We don't want to be caught by stuff and weighed down by stuff. And it's okay, whatever we've already done. We undertake the training in this new direction. There's a, a great story in the suttas. Um, someone who came to be known as Anguli Mala. Maybe you know, we've heard of the term Mala, someone who's even in bracelets or necklaces and gets a string of beads. And I guess Anguli must mean digit. I think that that's a literal translation of digit. But in this case, Anguli Mala was a murderer or a serial killer. And he had taken to cutting off the pinky of people he murdered and then had strung them and was wearing them as a garland or a necklace. And as I remember the story or the sutta, the discourse of the Buddha, he had killed 99 people. And he had been encouraged to go and kill his mother, but somehow the Buddha got intervened and helped him stop <laughs> before he killed his mom. Because if he had killed his mom, he would have been really screwed. But he didn't kill his mom. And he was able to ordain and receive full enlightenment because he undertook the training to not engage in this cause of suffering that he came to understand it. He couldn't go back and undo what he had done. Like, that shit has happened. And yeah, we undertake the training so that we might have future freedom and present moment freedom for our own benefit and the benefit of others. So that's a little bit on stealing or not stealing. You're undertaking the training not to take what is not offered. And that reminds me of one more thing I'm going to squeeze in here at the 11th hour. One of the cool ways also that I found to practice with this training in like my present day life is to play with not asking someone else to do for me what I could do for myself. Right? The impulse is there. And I'm in a room with someone else and they go into the other room and go, could you get this for me or could you do this for me? It's like, yeah, I could do that. But just for a day. Like, oh, what if I didn't do that? If I want the thing, what if I got up and got it? Like a glass of water or whatever it might be. It's like, oh, I can do it. And to not ask someone else to do for me what I could do for myself. And as I do that more and more, I don't expect other people to take care of my stuff. I feel more ownership and more freedom because I have way more agency over what I'm doing than what someone else is doing. So that can be a fun way to to play with this, not taking that which is not offered. Like, they didn't offer to get me a glass of water. You know, bring it off my butt and get a glass of water. It's empowering, I felt. Empowering. And empowering to recognize how these trainings can change our heart minds. Yeah. So thanks for your kind attention. I hope it supports you. fruits of our practice. Remembering that it's a practice, not a perfect. May the fruits of our practice be a benefit to all beings and bring peace and liberation to all.
Thank you for your kind attention.